There are two perspectives that we need to use when thinking of QoS. On one hand, every device in the network has its own QoS configuration. They are responsible for making its own decisions and taking action. The term for this is PHB, or per hop behavior. But all these independent devices work together to achieve a greater goal. That means that we also should think of QoS as end-to-end. -end. That is, the configuration on all these devices should work towards the same goal. Let's consider this example network. We have a main office and a branch office. There are phones at each site which make calls to each other. Some network equipment is close to the end devices, such as the switches that phones connect to. Other devices are in the middle of the network, while others, again, are out on the edge. We would consider voice call traffic between the phones to be of high importance. The phones definitely think so anyway. For this to be true, all routers and switches along the path need to consider this to be of high importance. While each device has its own QoS configuration, they all support the one end-to-end -end QoS goal. So how does QoS do this? When a switch or router receives a packet, the first thing it will need to do is classify it. That is, when a router receives packets, it sorts them into categories called classes. We can figure these classes ourselves. We'll continue with the example of a phone call. The phone generates a traffic and sends it to the switch. The switch sees this traffic and knows it is voice traffic. So as each packet arrives, the switch categorizes them as high priority. Each device will classify packets as they arrive. After classification, a device may take action on the traffic. It would be great if we have a nice healthy network with low latency and high bandwidth links. Then QoS wouldn't need to do anything. But that's not always going to be the case. Imagine that this device has recently received a lot of traffic and its links are filling to capacity. There are too many packets, so it needs to decide which packets to send and which to delay or drop. This is per hop behavior at work. This device uses its configuration to make its own independent decision about what to do. It will likely decide to send the voice call traffic first. It can then send the rest of the traffic when it can. There are various actions that QoS can take. These include rate limiting traffic, queuing and scheduling packets, and marking the packets. We're going to look at all these actions. We'll start with marking packets. Before a device sends a packet out, it can add a marking in the Ethernet or IP header. This marking is a value that identifies that traffic's class. Its purpose is to allow other devices along the path to make informed decisions about how to handle the packet. Marking is usually done as close to the source of the traffic as possible. In our example, the phone marks its own traffic. If the phone isn't capable of doing this, we could configure the switch to do it. When another device in the path receives the packet, it can read the marking and classify it. While there are other ways to perform classification, this is the most useful in most cases. These markings help us to achieve end-to-end -end QoS. If we have a good reason, we can even remark packets. An example of this is if we receive traffic from the internet that contains markings. We wouldn't trust these markings as we don't know who sent them or why. What if it's an attacker who wants us to treat their packets as a priority? In a case like this, we can change the marking on a packet or remove them completely. What we've seen here is called a trust boundary. That is the part of the network whose markings we trust. There are three different ways we can mark packets and frames. At layer two, frames passing over a trunk link can have a marking added to the ethernet header. We call this class of service. At layer three, there are two options, IP precedence and DSCP. Both of these add a value in the IP header. IP precedence has been out of date for some time leaving DSCP as the preferred choice. Ethernet frames consist of a header, payload, and data. In the header, there may be an 802.1Q field. This field will be here when a frame passes over a trunk link. Inside this field are a few subfields, one of which is the PRI field. This contains three class of service bits. Three bits means that we can have eight different combinations. 
These are class selectors, or CS0 through to CS7. The higher the class selector, the higher the priority of traffic. We would use class of service markings if we're dealing with layer two only, or if we have switches that aren't able to look at IP headers. The original type of layer three marking was IP precedence. The IPv4 header used to have an eight bit field called type of service. Like class of service, routers use three of these bits to mark packets. We call these a precedence or prac zero through to seven. DSCP has since replaced IP precedence. This is also known as diffserve. Two reasons for this are, one, it supports IPv6, and two, it uses six bits for markings, not three. Of these six bits, three are the class selector. This makes DSCP backward compatible with IP precedence. The remaining three are the drop probability. We'll look at what these do soon. First, we need to understand classes which are also known as forwarding classes. A class is the category that we organize traffic into. For example, we could have a class for real-time traffic like voice and video. We could have another class for network traffic like OSPF and BGP. We can have a few classes or we can have many classes. When a packet is in a class, our devices can make decisions based on that class. For example, a router would consider any traffic that is part of the real-time class to be very important. It will take action to make sure that it delivers those packets on time. The three code selected bits mark the forwarding class. That means that there are eight different forwarding classes, each with their own name. The special names are assured forwarding, expedited forwarding, and best effort. You'll see later on how these names make a bit more sense. So far, this is not much different to IP precedence, which also has eight categories. But we still have three bits from the drop probability field. These are kind of like a subclass within each assured forwarding class. That means that we could have interactive video and streaming video in the same class, but we could assign them different drop probabilities. This means that a router could prioritize interactive video over streaming video. One last thing to notice here is that we don't have multiple drop probabilities for every class. The reason is we don't really need that many different combinations. Even complicated networks are fine with the classes and drop probabilities shown here. So you can see how marking traffic makes things easier on us. It's especially useful for routers along the network path as it helps them to make good decisions.